So today I will tell you a little bit about type-driven domain modeling and how it can help you to improve the quality of your code and avoid some security issues by design. The term uh, domain-driven design was coined by Eric Evans in his book, in this book. Uh, you may have heard of it. It's also known as the Blue Book. Guess why? It was written almost 20 years ago, but many of its wisdoms are still relevant today. The core ideas of domain-driven design are that your code and its structure should match your business domain. The outline of your source code repositories, uh, repositories should give enough information to get what your business is about. It teaches you to focus on your core business logic and how to design your program so that technical details stay abstract and can be easily exchanged and replaced. While collaborating with the domain experts in your company, you develop an ubiquitous language that every person involved in the project can understand. No abstract single proxy factory beans allowed. Some popular concepts um, that were popularized by domain-driven design. Um, for example, entities are objects with an identity so entities are objects with an identity and a life cycle. Their values may change over time, but it stays the same object. Value objects, on the other hand, have no identity and are usually immutable. So two value objects with the same data are equal. That's not true for entities. Aggregates um, combine entities and protect their invariance. So if you have a shopping cart, for example, with several ordered items, the shopping cart is responsible for managing the total costs and all manipulations of the orders have to go through the shopping cart. Bounded contexts are one of the most important concepts in the book and Evan regrets that he didn't put more focus on them. Bounded contexts define uh, the different parts of your application and uh, the different parts of the application is made of. So within a bounded context, everyone speaks the same language. A customer in the sales department could be something completely different um, in your support department. Finding the correct boundaries isn't always easy, but they are great candidates to, uh, for putting into separate module libraries or microservices. DDD people usually follow something called persistence ignorance. Uh, they want to work with rich domain models and persistence is not a business concern. Sure, the data has to come from somewhere, but oftentimes it's not really relevant where it comes from. The repository pattern uh, provides the mapping layer between your domain and the outside world. They allow you to use your advanced types and classes and when you try to store or load them, convert them to simple data transfer objects, DTOs, and manage the communication with the database, the file system, or something completely different. Things that your business logic does not care about. Command query responsibility segregation, CQRS, acknowledges the fact that reading data and storing it are almost always very different operations. In CQRS, you don't use one model and one interface for everything, but have separate read and write models that can evolve completely separate uh, from each other. So what's up with the type driven in the title of this presentation? Object-oriented programming combined data and functions into classes, but classes are mainly used to separate responsibilities and should help in improving the maintainability of your code. The idea that types of classes can be used to encode business rules is rather new. There's this catchphrase, make illegal state unrepresentable. This means that you design your data types in a way that invalid combinations or state cannot even be expressed. So let's imagine you have a configurator with three settings. You could implement it with three Boolean flags, right? But you also know that some combinations simply do not work. If option B depends on option A, it shouldn't be possible to set B but not A. 
but the Boolean flag design does not prevent that. So you have to write runtime checks for that, write unit tests that should cover all possible combinations and so on. Expressive types also help in understanding uh, what a function does without looking at its implementation. If you see a function start server that accepts a string, another string, and an integer, it, is it really clear what it expects? But if it instead expects a file path and URL and a port, it's clear that this function has certain expectations on its input. So not every string is an URL and not all integers are valid ports. We can further build on this and even prevent certain security vulnerabilities by enforcing specially constructed values as inputs. You will see examples for that later. It's beneficial that you use immutable values for most of these techniques. Uh, that way you only have to perform validation logic once when creating the value. And if you design your application in a way that does not allow invalid state and input, your compiler prevents you from accidentally doing the wrong thing. You don't need to write runtime checks and don't need, to, uh, don't need unit tests for that. That's something we absolutely want as lazy programmers, right? Let me add a disclaimer here. The techniques that I'm going to show you can be used in all programming languages, especially the more general DDD patterns. But some make it easier than others especially statically typed languages, can get the most out of it, as these techniques can help you to catch more bugs at compile time. Still, even when using dynamically typed languages, some of these tricks can help improving your code quality. A powerful type system allows you to model your domain even more precisely in the world of types, so more bugs that can be caught automatically. Two features that are very nice are sometimes uh, some types and pattern matching. For simplicity, imagine that sometimes are enums on steroids, while pattern matching is the more powerful version of a switch case statement. Here's a small list of languages which provide a powerful type system. I will use some of them because they make it easy for me to express powerful concepts in a concise way. But fear not, even if you have never seen that particular language, I will explain everything in the examples that you need to know. The most popular ones on that list are probably TypeScript, C Sharp, and Java. Um, TypeScript has some types, has some types, but not pattern matching. C Sharp has pattern matching, but no sometimes. And Java 17 has both of them but these features are very new and probably still unknown to most of you. I assume that all of you know that null, wait, that doesn't look right. So better. Uh, so I assume that all of you know what null is uh, and the infamous null pointer exception that comes with it. Tony Oare, who brought us this gift, called, called it his billion dollar mistake. But what's exactly the problem here? Null is a value that is implicitly part of every type. It can, uh, it can always be returned. That makes it hard to provide reasonable advice that works in all situations. Some languages decided to avoid null and modeled the absence of values explicitly. And it's time to see some code. Uh, here's some code in, in Haskell. You will see, uh, see Haskell and languages related to it in a couple of times in this talk. So I will use it. Uh, so I will use these simple examples to explain the basic syntax to you. Haskell is a statically typed, purely functional programming language. It has the most powerful type system of all languages that were listed before and pioneered many ideas that now, over 20 years later, slowly get adapted to more mainstream languages. It can also automatically infer all types, so writing them down isn't strictly necessary. It's still considered best practice because it improves the readability of the code. Line number one shows a declaration of a new type. This type is called maybe. It's also known as option or optional in other languages. The little a here is a placeholder 
for an arbitrary type, basically the bracket T in Java or C sharp. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see two constructors for this type. So maybe can be either nothing or just, and then with this arbitrary type. So just in, just string, just bool, and so on. This is also an example for a sum type where there is a fixed set of possible values for a specific type, like I said, kind of similar to an enum. Maybe is used to explicitly declare that a value may be missing or that a function can fail. This means that a compiler can force you to provide checks for nothing, and therefore null pointer exceptions are not a thing. And it also means that when a value isn't wrapped in a maybe, then the value is definitely there. So you don't need defensive programming techniques where you check for null just to be sure. Lookup is a function. And line number two, you can see its signature. It expects a string as its first argument. Then it expects a list of tuples of a pair of strings. And it returns maybe string. There is a reason why the signature is written that way, but uh, for you, it's in enough if you know that all, all types are the input arguments, but the last one, that's the output type. Here we have the function body. Uh, the first string argument gets the name key and the second argument gets the name list. This function takes the key uh, and is searching for a matching key value pair in the list. Case of then performs pattern matching. Uh, with switch case statements, you can check for explicit values. And with real pattern matching, you can match for the structure of values and even more. In this case, we match on the structure of the list. If it is the empty list here, uh, we return nothing. So the value couldn't, couldn't be found because there's nothing left in the list. In, in Haskell, the last line of an expression is always implicitly returned. So we don't have to write return or something similar here. If the first pattern doesn't match, we go to the second one. Uh, it splits the list into two parts. The left, uh, left side of the column um, shows the, the tuple and we assign the name K for P for the first uh, part for the left side of the tuple and the, uh, name v for value for the right-hand side of the tuple. And the rest of the list, we just call rest. Now, if key is equivalent with k, then we return just v, so the value that we have found. And else, we recursively call the lookup function with the key and the rest of the list. In Haskell, it's not necessary to put parentheses around the arguments of a function. So that's why it's just uh, put after that one after another. The recursion then ends when the rest of the list is empty and the first case matches. Phone book is just some example data providing a list of tuples with string pairs. And get number is another function similar to lookup, but it returns a string. So a plain string and not maybe string. And if the name was found, the corresponding number to that name gets returned. So internally, it uses our lookup function uh, from before, but we can't just run lookup and then return its result because it returns a maybe string and not just a string or it returns just string, but yeah, you, you know what I mean. Um, so first we have to uh, pattern match on the result of calling lookup. If it's nothing, we return could not find a number for and concatenate that with the name. And if the return value was just, we extract the value, call it value, and then concatenate the name, then its number is, and then uh, the value, so the number. Uh, the compiler will complain to you and you can set uh, flags that it leads to a compilation error that if you use pattern matching and not check for all possible cases, then um, you have to provide them. So to get a better grasp of modeling concepts and ideas explicitly, 
let's try to model a contact type. We will begin with a simple model with only primitive types and steadily improve the design with rich types that encode business rules. Sounds like a good spot to jump into some code again. So this time I will use F sharp for that. It has a similar powerful type system uh, like Haskell, but has the huge benefit of running on the .NET platform. So you can integrate it into existing projects and access the huge .NET ecosystem. Let's dive in. So I will share another window. And here we are. So uh, here we have a type called contact. It contains a first name, initial, a last name, and an email address, all of strings. There's also this Boolean flag called is email verified with a comment that says that if uh, the verification flag was, con uh, the verification mail was confirmed, then this is set to true. But what happens when the mail address changes? Does it stay verified? We don't know, and we have to figure this out later. Looks like a typical contact, contact type to me, but we can do better. Um, there are now three types. Related data is now grouped into their own types. So we have the first type called personal name containing name related data. And there's also the type email contact info containing the mail address and the Boolean flag. Contact then wraps those two types. This is a little improvement, but still not any arbitrary string is a name uh, or an email address. So let's fix that too. The email type now lives in its own file. This gives us the power to only export certain functions from that module, similar to public and private functions in Java or C Sharp. We use this to implement the so-called smart constructor pattern. This line here shows that the type email address is still a string, but its constructor is private. Only functions in this file can access it. The rest, so all other modules, can only use the type. Um, we create two helper functions. So I had just received the message that maybe the sharing is broken. Is this true? No? OK. We create two helper functions, a create function, which will act as our new constructor, and a value function to extract the contained string. Like Haskell, F sharp is a statically typed language, but can also fully infer all types. So we don't have to write them here explicitly. The value function just unwraps this container type. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, it just unwraps this container type, uh, but the create function is a little bit more elaborated. It accepts a string as its input and uses a regular expression to check if this string contains an add symbol. But this is not the best check, but uh, we will later find a better solution for this. This function returns an option of email address, so similar to optional or in, in Java or maybe in Haskell. If the check succeeds, we return some with the email address. And if it fails, we return none. The caller then has to check if the creation was successful or not. As this function is the only way to create something of type email address, everyone is forced to go through this validation process. If we now look at the rest of our types, some other things have changed too. Instead of using strings, our email contact info type now uses the email address type. The names have changed too. Uh, they also use smart constructors now, uh, but in this case, they just limit the maximum amount of characters allowed. Initial is also now marked as option to clarify that this value may not exist. We still have this Boolean flag here. Um, which we don't really tell us much about its, its business process. So it's time to solve this problem too. So the email module was rewritten again. 
the email contact info type is now part of this file and part of this module. It uh, has, it's, it's, it's now a sum type. It has two constructors. It's either unverified with the email address type or it's verified with the verified email address type. Here you can see the email address is still a string and its constructor is public. And verified email address is also just a string, but its constructor is private and uses again the smart constructor pattern. We have our value function here, so that hasn't changed, but we got two new other functions, store verification code and verify. Store verification code expects an email contact info and the verification code as arguments and performs pattern matching with match with on the contact. If the contact is already ver verified, we just return void uh, or unit, how it's called in F sharp. If it's unverified, we unwrap the contained string in the email address and then store the address and the verification code in the database. Uh, the code can then be sent as an activation link to the user. Verify then later expects email contact info and a verification code. In the case that the, verif in, that the contact is already verified, we just return sum with the contact again. And else when the contact is unverified, we unwrap the email address and check if the verification code that was passed in into this function is uh, the same one that was stored in the database. If this is true, then we return sum with the verified email address. And if this uh, fails because the code doesn't match, then we return none. So instead of using uh, some Boolean flags, we now have static guarantees that all verified email addresses went through this verification process. Nothing really has changed for our contact type here as it was already using the email contact info type, but send password reset email and change email are example functions that demonstrate how you can then use these types to your advantage. Send password reset email expects a verified email address. There's no way to send a password reset mail to an address that has not been verified before. Sorry, attackers. There's uh, also the change email address, which is used when a user wants to change uh, their email address and it accepts a string. And at this stage, the only available constructor is the unverified email address as the verified constructor can only be used in a verification flow. So you have no more Excuses like, oh, I forgot to reset the flag when the data has changed. This was a brief overview on how you can use these types to describe your business domain, but that was not all uh, that types can give us. So let's hear more about them um, in this slide. So I will try to share them once again. Yeah, so type security. As a penetration tester, I see a lot of code of questionable quality. Many vulnerabilities exist because they are so easy to make. In this chapter, I want to present some ideas how you can use types so that your compiler prevents you from implementing some of the most common vulnerabilities. If you're not familiar with the OWASP top 10, it's a list of the 10 most common security vulnerability classes found in web applications. They get updated every few years, and the current one is from a few months ago. I picked three of them because types can help us to prevent them. Broken access control is rather self-explanatory. Attackers can access data they should not have access to. Injection attacks refer to attacks like SQL or OS injections, but also cross-site scripting. An attacker provides input that gets interpreted as code giving the attacker control over your server or the browser of some other users. Okay. <laughs> so, um, sorry for that. Insecure design is rather unspecific and can mean many things, I guess, as we try to design our ways in a way that secure becomes the default state, we avoid this vulnerability class. 
And if you still thought that the latest OS Top 10 is from 2017, you should check up with the new version after this talk. The OWASP publishes other top 10 lists too, uh, for example, for API backends. They share some similarities with the previous ones. Number one and three are basically broken access control. Number eight is injection attacks, but three and six are new. They occur when you expose too much data to external clients or accept too much from them. Let's start with broken access control and how we can fix them. It's another demo time, and this has absolutely nothing to do with the example being too large to fit on one slide. A company rolled out a new version of the web service, and shortly after, an attacker did bad things. It's our job now to fix this problem in a way that this cannot happen anymore. Here we have parts of a web controller. We have routes for get, put, and delete. That looks like a simple CRUD application to me. We fetch the current user here, extract the article ID from the URL path. We check if this user can access that particular article. Uh, if it's not allowed, we return 401 not authorized as a status code. And if it's allowed, then we just perform the action here. Can anyone spot the bug that was introduced during the refactoring? Just write it into the chat. And it would be great if I could see the chat, but that's apparently not possible. <laughs> so maybe I will just continue. <laughs> I can see it, but unfortunately nobody knows it. <laughs> If you have a few more seconds, it's not too obvious. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, no. so when the code was rewritten, someone forgot, uh, forgot to include the not here. This, of course, flips the Boolean check. So now legit users couldn't delete article, articles, but everyone else could, and an attacker swooped in and deleted everything. And that's why we have backups. We want to solve this problem once and for all, and types will save us. This is our new authorization module. Down below here, you can see the two functions that were originally called and that return Booleans. But Boolean checks don't prove anything. Once you leave the if else branch, it's like no check happened at all and you can call everything in your application. And we don't want that. We want static proofs that an authorization check happened and we can use types for this proof. At the top, you can see three new types, um, access article and modify article, just wrap an article ID and they can be seen as some kind of access level or permission level. Uh, new uh, access token is just a generic wrapper around some generic type A. Uh, so for example, there could be an access token access article or an access token modify article. We have this function here called token data, which just extracts the contained value in this, in this wrapper. So similar to the value function in our F sharp example. And we have two functions, get access article token and get modify article token, which perform the authorization check uh, using the old Boolean based functions. And, but instead of just returning that Boolean, we then wrap the result in first the permission level or access level and then with the access token. And because this check can fail, it's then also in a maybe. So we have here just and a nothing. Now let's look at the module definition. Uh, for access art, so uh, the module definition, this is the export list. So these are the functions that are available outside in other modules when this module gets imported. So again, like public and private functions. For access article and modify article, this dot dot thing here means that we export the constructors. So other modules can create values of this type and can unwrap them. 
That's why we don't have to provide some value extraction function or similar. But the constructor for access token is not exposed. So it's private. The only way to get an access token is by calling the get access article token or get modify article token function here. Note that the Boolean functions are also not exposed, but that's only half of the solution because the rest of our application does not expect any access tokens yet. So let's change that. It's up to you at which layer you want to require the access tokens. In this example, the service layer called by the web controllers expects a token. Before our refactoring, these three functions just accepted an article ID directly and did their jobs. Now they accept access tokens instead. And note how they only require the permission level that's necessary for the job. So we got a nice implementation of the principle of least authority going on here. The implementation then is rather trivial. They get a token, they unwrap the token, then extract the article ID from the permission level, and then uh, use it just for the database stuff. It's literally just one more line for unwrapping the token. So we haven't really increased the complexity of our code with this change. The last place we have to change is our controller. We now call our new authorization functions and pattern match on the maybe. If we get nothing, we again return our 401 not authorized status code here. And if we get just and then the token, we uh, pass the token to the service layer where they do their job. And that's all there is to this. At the end, we only had to add a few lines of code for wrapping and unwrapping the access token. Um, because you have to write some kind of authorization logic anyway, we just added types to convert these checks into static proofs, and therefore our compiler can force us to perform authorization checks. Now, back to the slides. Let's tackle injection attacks now. So another Haskell application. Uh, this time we use uh, SQLite as a database engine. Um, it gets a connection to some SQLite database. We ask the user to provide some product name. We then search for that product name in the database and print the result to the console. Um, this uh, library that is being used here is a very simple library. It's, it's even called simple. <laughs> it's not a fully fledged OAM. And we have to write SQL by hand. This sounds like something that could be susceptible to a SQL injection. If you make the mistake of uh, accidentally concatenating the SQL query and the user input, you are owned. The solution to this are prepared statements, of course, but that's something you have to know and actively think about. So what's the magic here? It's simple. Uh, SQL query is not a string. It has the type query. It's not even a very sophisticated type. It's literally just a wrapper around normal strings. But all relevant functions in that library, like this query function, uh, expects that type instead of a normal string. This distinction between a query and a string avoids the number one reason for SQL injections, the string concatenation of user input with queries. In line number 10, you can see that I explicitly convert this SQL code by calling the query constructor from the SQL module. Performing a concatenation with user input is not possible anymore because this would result in a compilation error because the types don't match. In this case, the wrapper even gets eliminated at compile time, so there is absolutely zero overhead of using this technique. Rust isn't the only language with zero cost abstractions. It happens that we have to deal with data that can be considered as valuable or secret. Using them inside our program is usually not a problem, but we have to be careful not to leak them to the outside. In this Java example, our user class contains the password hash of the user. That's something we would like to keep to ourselves. 
we can solve this by using data transfer objects. Here I call it user view model um, to give it a more explaining name. A DTO is a separate data type specifically made to be used for data exchange and crossing boundaries. That's we, why we have to fall back to primitive types because other applications would not uh, understand our custom data types. When we create a new DTO, we are in the mindset of returning only the necessities to the caller. In this case, the caller does not need to know the internal ID of the user. We also know that the first and last name are always displayed together. So we can provide a single computed value called full name here. We return the date of the birth, but as the date time uh, type and not our cost, uh, custom birth date type. And the password has hash stays with us. The user view model is also responsible for, for providing the methods to convert from and to the domain model. The outside world is no concern to our domain model. That's why these functions uh, would have no place there. This makes it also very easy to change, for example, the serialization library later on without having to touch our core types. Get users could be a function in our controller. It calls the user service to get all the users. At this stage, they are still our domain type. And then we map over all these users and convert them to our view model and return those then back to the caller. One benefit of using custom domain types is that they do not usually use primitive data types that you have to. So you have to provide some kind of conversion function anyway, as no external code will work with your types out of the box. Might as well use the chance and prevent some security issues. Applying the reverse then solves the problem with mass assignment, the, the other OWASP category. You explicitly create DTOs for input data with only the fields that clients are supposed to modify and later convert them to your domain types. Elm is a purely functional programming language architecture and framework for creating single page web applications. It transpiled to JavaScript and maybe some later stage to um, WebAssembly and has the most friendly and useful compiler errors you will ever see. You write web frontends with Elm. So preventing cross-site scripting attacks is a huge concern. The solution to this is similar to the one for the injection attacks. A web page is not an arbitrary string. It's HTML, which has certain properties. You can only return web pages in Elm if they have the type HTML. There are a few functions that accept strings and convert them to HTML, like this uh, text function. And as you can see, the diff functions already uh, expects HTML, so it wouldn't work with string. Um, all these functions, so text and the others, uh, perform output encoding and escaping. So JavaScript code does not get interpreted as code when displayed in HTML. Again, the compiler is forcing you here to pass your potentially dangerous user input through a conversion function that takes the danger out of it. You cannot forget to do this. The compiler is your friend. Some of you may ask, does this work with all applications? And the answer in general is probably, maybe, I don't know. But there's one particular architecture for business applications that works especially well with this domain-driven approach. And it has many names. It's hexagonal architecture, onion architecture, clean architecture. It's also called ports and adapters. And the functional approach to this is called pure core imperative shell. They all describe the same idea. Your business logic should be in the core of your application. The core does not depend on any external system. All layers point inwards dependency-wise. If the core wants to work with something, it provides interfaces, which the outer layers then implement. Your rich domain types live in these two inner layers, validated, 
filled with business logic and protected from the outside impure world. In the outer layers, you provide your DTOs that bridge that gap between your application and the real world. For example, uh, one of your services may expect um, an interface to provide a function that returns the current weather for a specific location. Your domain experts don't care how this is implemented. That's a technical detail. In your production system, one of the outer layers would then provide uh, an implementation for that, probably by fetching data from an API. You would then test that by using integration tests with real implementations. But integration tests are slow and we want fast feedback loops. So for testing our services and use cases, so the inner layers, we can also provide mocks and stops. But the core consists or should consist mostly of pure functions that perform data transformation. So testing them is very easy. You just call the functions with arguments and check their return values. You can run thousands of these tests in milliseconds. But how does this architecture look like in, in, in real code? Here are some snippets from a C-sharp project called Packet. It's part of this mini course I stumbled upon about clean architecture in CQRS, link down below here, and you can also scan the QR code. It's only, only eight hours long, but contains so much information and knowledge that I can highly recommend it. On the left, you can see the general project structure. There's an API module, there's an application module, a domain module, and an infrastructure module. There are also these uh, two modules called shared because they are shared between the other modules. You can also see that the inner modules like domain and application um, have way more folders than the other ones. So they really try to put most of their code um, into the core layers where they are not concerned with the external world and infrastructure concerns. Uh, in this screenshot here, we can see the content of the command folder. So this application splits use cases between commands and queries. So we have CQRS here. Uh, in this folder, you can then see all state changing actions that are possible. Let's look into the add packing item class. This handler is, is called by the web controller. Um, it receives a command and the command is just the input that was provided by the user, uh, which the web controller converted into a command. In this case, it's packing list ID, uh, name and quantity. We can see that it only relies on abstractions. So th that's a, a C sharp thing. So system is uh, kind of an exception here, but it only uses the internal uh, or the, the inner layer one modules, like the repository and the interface of a repository and not the concrete implementation of it. When it fetches the packing list, um, it uses a repository. So it expects the domain type for packing list and not kind of uh, some kind of DTO. It turns the name and the quantity of the command into the packing item domain uh, class and then adds it to the packing list using the language of the domain. In this case, it's add item. And at last, it stores the updated packing list via the repository again. If we look at the packing item class here, we see that some business rules are enforced. It uses a record and not a normal class. Um, records are handy because they are immutable by default and provide equality based on values and not identity. So uh, value objects. In this case, the business rule seems to be that the name of the item uh, cannot be null or a white space. And that's great because this class or this record is immutable. We never have to check this again when using that item. There's a lot more that can be found in this code base. So if you want to see and hear more about this, please watch that video. I also have some book recommendations. If you want to learn more about functional programming and domain modeling, I can highly recommend this book by Scott Vlashin. 
I've read it multiple times, and it's a great resource for ideas that will make your programming life easier. And for the object-oriented programmers, there's Implementing Domain-Driven Design by Vaughan Burnham, which is a modern take on the blue book, also called the red book. Who would have thought? So um, the key takeaways, make illegal state unrepresentable, less tests to write and less bugs to experience. Encode business rules in your types. Guide other programmers by designing your types and functions in a way that makes it obvious how to use them and what to expect. Parse don't validate. So there's actually a nice blog post with that same phrase. If you perform any kind of validation or check, embed that knowledge by wrapping it in a type. Boolean checks are ephemeral. Once you leave the branch, there's no proof that you have ever performed the validation. Use the compiler to your advantage. Let it prevent you from doing stupid mistakes. Using rich domain types basically lets the compiler write free tests for you. It makes sure that you cannot call functions with invalid data. Tests for free. Don't miss this offer. Use words that domain experts understand. Work with them and get valuable feedback. Your documentation can't get outdated if the code itself is the documentation. And last but not least, eliminate security vulnerabilities by design. You get great security when it's the default and you have to do extra stuff to shoot yourself in the foot. And with this, we are done. Thanks for listening. Um, I'm happy to answer all your questions now and general feedback is also very welcome. And to those of you who are already leaving, have a nice evening and happy hacking. So thank you very much. No problem for the unintended audio insert. Uh, while you were talking, there was um, some discussion on the chat uh, concerning yeah. if everyone uses, if anyone uses um, what is called Haskell. So it seems that uh, only you know it. <laughs> I'm using it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, it's also, um, um, even if you don't use it for production code, just learning it for some simple toy projects will teach you some very valuable lessons that you can then apply to other programming languages too. But it is rather different than, than languages that you are probably used to. So it really forces you to a different mindset these other languages that are these hybrid languages. So F sharp can be used in an object oriented way and Scala and Clojure and all the others, they can be used in different paradigms. So you can always fall back to the way you know, but because Haskell only supports that one way you have to learn how to do it and then can that apply and can then apply this knowledge to your other programs. If anyone has a question, please feel free to unmute yourself or raise hands and I un unmute you. I hope there are some questions. It was really interesting, even for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely was. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Hi. Uh, how I have one question. How how would look the the unit testing in in uh, using this approach? So what, how would we how would we write the tests? For example, for, for from the samples that you show in different languages. Did you get the question? I I don't I, know if I understood it. I hadn't had any audio for 15 seconds or so so i can you maybe write it in the chat yeah i think i will do that so um, perfect because it's sorry. a little bit bad audio connection the, the connection seems to be unstable right yeah. now i also get some pop-ups
but I think that's a Zoom issue currently. But there is another question in the chat. How many apps are developed like this? Are there prominent examples? Um, I think Microsoft is the biggest proponent of that. So Microsoft and the whole C-sharp ecosystem, they are the largest part of this whole domain-driven design um, trend or hype, whatever. It's, it's been here for over 15 years. Um, so you can also find most of the documentation and almost all example codes that you will find are in C-sharp. So yeah, there are. Um, very large applications that are written this way, not all of these techniques. So this whole, uh, whole authorization check thingy is, I guess, rather unknown, but um, domain-driven design in general um, is, is really in use, yeah. So until the next question comes, I will post a link to our YouTube channel right here, uh, where we have all the security meetup videos so far and where you can also find this video afterwards in a few days. So another question regarding unit testing. How can we leverage the same approach of type-driven domain design when writing unit testing code? I'm still not sure if I get this question because the types or the classes don't make any difference when you write your unit tests. So um, you create your classes, uh, which then at the, at the construction time, most probably, um, check some uh, conditions. If all the input arguments match some certain expectations, uh, and then you write unit tests to check if you uh, implemented everything correctly. And that's basically it. The, the benefit here is uh, if you use immutable uh, objects, you really only have to check this at, uh, at the construction time of the object and don't have to check this everywhere in your application. So if you have, uh, for example, some function that expects an email address, and you just use a plain string for that, you always, in any function, have to check, okay, is the string null? Is the string empty? Is it just white space? Is the string some number? And if you then just combine all that knowledge into one class or one type, make it immutable, you have only one place that you have to check, only one place where you have to write a unit test for that, and everything else is basically done for you. And if Thank you have these. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, I was expecting that answer. <laughs> Great. I, I just wanted to be sure that, the, I mean, there is uh, no other um, things to consider regarding this. So, um, usually, if you have these, um, your domain types, they are pure. So, they don't have any side effects. They don't access something from the internet, not the file system. They don't talk to the database. So, they just expect some arguments to construct the type. Um, and then you can very easily unit test them because you don't have to mock and stop things. You don't have to write an integration test where the whole uh, web suite or uh, some other framework has to start. And yeah, that's, that's one of the benefits of this. Oh, cool. I didn't know this book, so. Great recommendation. Which color does it have? <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Is it just, was it just me being offline or? Yeah, your video was frozen for a few <laughs> seconds. <laughs> uh, Alex, also, I, I know Alex here. I haven't written Erlang, um, but it's one of the best languages, that's for sure. Um, big, big Erlang and Alex, you fan.
Yeah. <laughs> the functional language that is more object oriented than Java. So basically Haskell and Elixir and I don't need anything else, yeah. <laughs> the only thing that annoys me a little bit is that Erlang and, and Elixir are dynamically typed, but they have reasons for that and that's okay. And uh, I accept it. <laughs> So if there are no more questions, um, you can for sure write uh, Michel afterwards if you want to know um, something more. Yeah, but I say thank you once again. It was a really nice talk. Thank you too and for having me. Hope to see some or all of you at our special meetup, February 24th, you remember. And yeah, have a really nice evening, enjoy it. And I'll say goodbye from SBE. Goodbye, goodbye, good night. Good night or day, wherever you are. <laughs> wherever you are, yeah. <laughs> Bye. I wait some more seconds and then I close. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we should uh, yeah, stop the, the recording stop the recording and provide the slides then in the YouTube link or something. Yeah.